what's up what's up what's up um i'm back again with another video um this video is going to be just me a little bit ranting and talking about some nba news that has recently happened some really really exciting nba news that i'm like just excited to get into um first malcolm brogdon traded to the boston celtics in a deal for i think Nate Neesmith, Daniel Theis, and a first-round draft pick. If I'm wrong, correct me in the comments. Let me know exactly what the deal was. Rudy Gobert, the big trade, going to Minnesota for, I believe, five first-round draft picks, four of which are unprotected until 2029, when that one is, I think, top three or top four protected, along with Jared Vanderbilt, along with Patrick Beverly and other pieces, going to Minnesota, uh, and Rudy Gobert going to uh, – go going to uh minnesota and other pieces going to utah i'm sorry i'm all over the place right now but um those moves are big i really like the rudy gobert to minnesota to minnesota trade i think that that's going to raise minnesota's ceiling even more it's going to make carl anthony towns better it's going to make rudy, uh anthony edwards better if they keep d -Lo, it's going to make d'angelo russell better like it's just going to make that whole team better what he does for a team's defense May not be individually, but for a team's defense, which last time I checked, basketball was a five-on-five -five sport. What he does for a team's defense cannot be replicated, I don't think, by any center in the NBA. He could literally turn a bottom 30 defense into a top 10 defense, team-wise. That is an elite anchor. That is why he's making $200 million. So many people like to focus on his defensive, I mean, his offensive deficiencies and him getting dunked on and stuff like that. But when you're playing in Utah and nobody on the perimeter can stay in front of their man, nobody on the wings can stay in front of their man, and you constantly have to make up for other people's mistakes, that's tough for anybody. Rudy Gobert is good. He's not Superman. We got to stop expecting him to do all of these different things. He has deficiencies like every other player in the league. But what he's great at is just it's exceptional. It cannot be de replicated. And I love that this move slides Carl Anthony Towns to the power forward position. I believe that that's going to unlock their offense even more. Having Carl Anthony Towns be able to shoot and shoot his 41, 42, 43% from three on five, six, seven attempts and not really losing size. And then you can always have, you can take Carl Anthony Towns off and still have Rudy Gobert playing high minutes and he's durable. You can take Rudy Gobert off and, and slide Cat to the five. Minnesota, want, I, I believe that Minnesota, for what they're trying to do right now, they want to trade as of today because they're trying to compete as of today. Utah is not, I'm hearing Donovan Mitchell is going to Miami. I'm hearing that's a lock. Uh, so I don't think that Utah is holding on to Donovan Mitchell. I don't buy that they're trying to build around Donovan Mitchell. They are trying to get a package to add on to the picks that they got from Rudy Gobert. They're trying to move Donovan to Miami. They're trying to get all of Miami's picks to Utah. They're trying to double dip. They're hoping that those picks land in the top 10. They're hoping that it blows up. They want multiple first round picks on top of the picks that they already have. So I think that Utah Jazz and Danny Ainge is just going in a full scale rebuild. That's just my opinion. That's just where I see it at. For the Boston Celtics, man, I, I want to, uh, I love the Malcolm Brogdon trade. I, I want to start there. I love it. I love what it does for their team. It, it, it gives them more depth. It gives them more playmaking, something that they suffer with like sorely in the finals, in the Eastern Conference Finals, in the semi-conference finals, they struggle with it. I don't even if even though they won those series, you can still win and have deficiencies and struggle with things. That's why they struggle closing, in my opinion. Malcolm Brogdon helps take away a lot of the ball handling responsibilities and the playmaking responsibilities of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, letting them focus on what they're great at, which is ISO scoring. That is what they're great at. I, I love the trade. But I want to talk about Colin Cowher for a second, man. I'm I'm so annoyed by this, man. So I'm looking at a tweet. I see a tweet this morning. He said, I got to give Celtics fans credit. I never knew adding Malcolm Brogdon to your team guaranteed a title. Learn something new every day. So let me tell you why guys like him in the national media constantly do the NBA a disservice. They constantly do it, and it's so pretentious. It's, it's so annoying. They get on their high horse. They, act, they, they spew these narratives, and they spew these nonsense things. We are in an era where so many people think that you need a name. Kyrie, James Harden, Kevin Durant, 
Russell Westbrook. We are in this era where we feel like you need names more than you need quality players. And those names can be quality players. I'm not trying to say that. But if you are a piece away, why would you trade three to four pieces to bring in a big name? That doesn't make sense. Malcolm Brogdon closes the, the, the deficiency that they had, the playmaking gap that we just talked about, that ball handling gap that we just talked about, even defense, even catching and shooting and, and depth. Malcolm Brogdon gives them that. Malcolm Brogdon's biggest deficiency his entire career has been health. That's been the thing that's been hindering him. As a player, this can be a deal that's similar to what Milwaukee did with Drew Holiday. I remember when they made that Drew Holiday trade. First round pick swaps. Oh my God, what are the Milwaukee Bucks doing? That's too much for Drew Holiday Championship. The very next season, the same year they traded for Drew Holiday Championship. That's what a player like that can do. When you already have the pieces in place and you don't have to trade away two, three, four, five players plus 17 first round draft picks for a big name and you get to keep your continuity, you get to keep your depth, you get to keep your winning culture, bring somebody into the winning culture, and you get to have a guy coming to that that has been losing on a bad Indiana team since he signed there from Milwaukee. And now you bring him to a team where he's not going to be expected to be the first option or the second option or the third option, maybe even not the fourth option. But he's going to fit into that system. That is what a player like that can do. That is why Celtics fans should be excited. I, I don't understand. I, I see it from Chris Broussard. I see it from Nick Wright. I see it from Shannon Sharp. I see it from Stephen A. Smith. We, the, the guys in the national media are doing the NBA fans, the casuals, not me, but the casual fans, they are doing them a disservice. You are doing them a disservice by constantly focusing on names instead of productivity, instead of, instead of quality. Every time I'm talking to somebody, the DeJounte Murray trade to Atlanta Hawks, people don't think that that's a big splash. That's a huge splash for what DeJounte Murray brings to the table. That's going to help Trey Young. But because it's not Kyrie Irving, because it's not Kevin Durant, nobody, they, they don't really, we don't talk about it. We should be talking about that move like how Rudy Gobert going to Minnesota is a big time move. That's a big time move. Malcolm Brogdon going to the Celtics. That's a big time move. These are big time moves. Just as big as wherever Kevin Durant lands. Just as big as wherever Kyrie Irving lands. Just as big as wherever Donovan Mitchell lands. Regardless of where we may think they land, and we know it's going to make ripples and waves in the media, that, that's just my biggest pet peeve with everything. The last thing I want to talk about. And I made a, a Twitter thread about this. I ran it earlier. And I just, I had, I had to rant. I had, I had to get this out. Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, man. I don't, I don't understand this era of sports that we're in. Some fans are in the middle. Some fans are far right. Some fans are far left. And I'm in that middle range. I'm in that common sense range. I'm not one of these stupid fans that believe loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. I'm not one of these fans like that. But I'm also not a fan a fan of player movement, player movement, player movement. I'm not a fan of that neither. I'm a fan of context, looking at the situation, looking at what's going on, evaluating it, and going from there. That's what I'm a fan of. I'm a fan of context, common sense, critical thinking, reading between the lines. That's what I'm a fan of when it comes to player movement. And I was in the net spaces uh, earlier uh, last night. And I know, for y'all don't know what spaces is, it's a Twitter thing where it's like a live podcast. A lot of people in there get to talk and express their opinions. And I'm seeing Nets fans mad at the organization. And I don't want to come off like I know more than Nets fans about Nets business because I don't. But from the outside looking in, why isn't Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant getting the majority of the blame? Why, why is that? The Brooklyn Nets made a terrible trade to the Boston Celtics when they acquired Jason Terry, Paul Pierce, and Kevin Garnett. They mortgaged their future to surround those guys with then Darren Williams, Joe Johnson, and Brooke Lopez. I believe, maybe, 
they won one playoff series with that team. And I might be, I might be wrong. They might not have won none. They mortgaged their future and it for those. Those picks that they traded ended up being Jalen Brown, ended up being Jason Tatum. Might have been the being Marcus Smart. I'm not sure. I don't remember that far back. But I do know those two players. Two players that are elite wings, all NBA caliber wings in today's league. And they mortgaged that. They, they built. So they lost those guys. All those guys are gone. They retired, whatever. They rebuilt back up their culture. They hired a great coach in Kenny Atkinson after the Jason Kidd debacle. Traded for D'Angelo Russell, a player that was not finding his way in the league after the Lakers debacle with the Nick Young thing. Got Karis LeVert. Got Joe Harris. Got Spencer Dinwiddie. Got Jared Allen. They built up that culture. Brought in Jared Dudley. Veteran present. They were a fun team in 2019. Took the Philadelphia 76ers to six games, ultimately losing in the first round. But they established a culture. Very similar to the uh, Clippers in 2019 as well. They, they established a culture. And what happened? What happened after Kyrie and Kevin Durant get there? Well, they signed. Big deal. That's a big deal. Hats off. Great move. They want Kenny Atkinson gone. Brooklyn fires Kenny Atkinson. Bad move, in my opinion. They fired him. Kevin Durant goes there, sign and trade. They trade, they send D Lo to Golden State. Spencer Dinwiddie is there. Jared Allen is there. Karis LeVert is there. They trade Karis LeVert and Jared Allen for James Harden. All, again, mortgage their future for a guy that's going after a season of work. And they make the organization sign DeAndre Jordan and not only sign him to a four-year, $40 million extension, but they want him to start over Jared Allen. That money could have been used to, to for depth, anything. They spent it on DeAndre Jordan. Now, after Kyrie has doesn't want to play his first season, doesn't want to play his second season, doesn't can't play his third season. Now the Nets are like, well, hold on, we don't want to just give Kyrie a deal. We want to incentivize it and make sure he stays on the court and, and earns his money. Oh, that's disrespectful. Right when the organization draws a line in the sand, when we can argue they should have drew a long time ago, but when they finally decide to draw a line in the sand and say, enough's enough, we're not going to take it anymore, Kyrie's appalled, he wants out. Kevin Durant's appalled, he wants out. And they're blameless, they're less to blame than the organization. I don't understand that. I can't wrap my mind around it. Is the hezzy tween in the bag that mesmerizing where we are not, we are no longer holding guys accountable. I, I, I just don't understand it. Um, that's the end of my rant. I had to get that out of my head. I had to voice it. And I said, let me record this and put it on the internet. Um, thank you guys for watching as always like, and subscribe red nation blog out.